Hey, Chris. Hi, Chris. And Darius, have you made me a, a co-host? Yes, I have. Okay, wonderful. Hi, Chris. How are you? You can't hear me. It's connecting. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <clears throat> this is a great day because today is our final meeting. Of, we have a product, and that's a great thing. But more importantly, we've had an experience. So I want us to spend today reflecting on the experience. So I have about five questions that I thought that we could go through and uh, talk about in relationship to this video studio, how it worked out, some of the things that we learned. And uh, I've tried to kind of write the questions in a way that will uh, open ended and hopefully you will give, you know, just a little bit of uh, feedback so that we'll have this to reflect on. So I want to first of all start by thanking you all for having just participated in this experience because it's been wonderful for me. I've told you that I've learned a lot. Um, are you ready to see our final product? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, we're going to look at the final product. I'm going to share it with you now, and then I'm going to go back and go through the questions. I'm already on. Hi, so. Hi. I'm so glad you're here so that you can see this uh, final product. And are we all ready? Yeah. Yep, here we go. Let me share my screen. And there we are. And then let me move us over so that I can, oh, good, that was good. And now I'm going to make it large. And here we go. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Stop, stop, stop. How do I stop? Ah, stop. Don't do that. Okay. Sorry. Stop sharing. I got to start it again. Go back to the beginning. Okay. Now, I want to cut that sound up. Okay, now I'll begin again. Wait a minute. Sorry. Film is about protecting our human rights as people. And the question is, how do you respond when someone's words or actions violate your rights as a human being? How do you respond when someone's words or actions violate your human rights? My response is usually um, a little bit of shock. A violation that I'm unwilling to tolerate. Bullying is one. If I see anybody... You can't see your mind. screen. When people yell at me. Oh, uh, yeah. We can't see your screen. The you can't. No. no. You can't see the. Stop. You can't see the screen. No. No, we can't see the screen. Oh, okay. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. I was so nervous about getting there. Okay, so let me go back. Share screen. <coughs> Share screen. Share. Uh. The film is about protecting our human rights as people. And the question is, how do you respond when someone's words or actions violate your rights as a human being? How do you respond when someone's words or actions violate your human rights? Right. My response is usually um, a little bit shocked. A violation that I'm unwilling to tolerate. Bullying is one. If I see anybody picking on somebody. When people yell at me. One is putting your finger in that. The judge's opinion. It's just like calling other people like racist slurs and stuff. First response, I would be very shocked. My first instinct would be to try to educate the other person. I would try to calm down and say, and tell them I don't like when you yell at me. I'm going to say, please don't touch my hair because I don't like it when you touch my hair. So when people are just saying words, that's easy for me to kind of let that roll off my back. It's up to you to choose how you want to react. Once I'm 
no longer shocked and I'm processing what's happening to me. And to go and speak out and speak up for the people who aren't speaking for themselves. Judging someone's opinion or my opinion, I really, I cannot, I hate it. Do you want to talk about it or something? And make sure the other party understands my point of view and understand right from wrong. I'm going to tell my mom or my teacher. Um, and they're probably dealing with something in their life, so they take it out on other people. Solve the problem. Okay. First choice, you could duck his head on and pretend he didn't see anything. Second choice, you could call the police. Third choice, you could try to intervene. We have to teach people how to respect us and also teach them how to be treated. Uh, there's no need for you to be racist. Because they may not know. And when people violate my rights with their actions and words, people can only receive help or only change their ways to the consequences. I'm um, okay with correcting someone's behavior. I would have to follow up with filing a police report, filing a complaint. To defend myself, uh, but in a way in which it does not uh, bring myself or my daughter any shame. Some people sometimes are crazy, so they have a, so they have a gun with, the, with them, and they're like, I need help, and then they, and then the person refuses to bring out the gun. Oh, uh, thinking that I'm not gonna come back one day. Protest, confront them, and say, uh, "Why are you doing this? Why is it to this person?" To try and de-escalate the situation. Uh, because what we allow, we encourage. I am going to definitely file a complaint, a formal complaint, um, against that person or that party. I'm going to tell my mom or my teacher. Take their hate and use that as positive energy. And abuse your, abuse your freedom of speech, right? Peaceful solutions and speaking out is the best way. And make sure this individual doesn't just understand my point of view, but understands the law as well. It's like Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd, and countless others. Philando Castile, Trayvon Martin. <laughs> Okay, stop sharing. In a second. So, we worked on a lot of different technical skills. We worked on uh, content, and I want to start with a couple of content questions. So now that you've produced and worked on this, I would like to ask, in what ways did the topic of human rights encourage you to think freely, and in what ways do you think it encouraged the folks that you interviewed uh, that you encourage their critical thinking. When you think about the topic of human rights that we explore, in what ways did this experience encourage you and the folks that you interview to have to do use critical thinking? Well, um, it made us think about how we respond if someone violates them, violates our human rights, like how we would uh, respond or how we would like react. When you think about the participants uh, talking, just them talking about their responses, how did, it, did you get any sense of how it made them feel just to be able to express their perspective? Um. Uh, 
ponder that question for a few minutes and uh, think about what new understandings emerged from the participants about building resi resistance in the community. Did you get any sense of the community from the way the people responded? Because almost none of the responses were violent responses. Why is that? Were people just being careful with what they said? Did they genuine? Did you get a sense of that genuinely, the heart that they came from? What, what is your uh, understanding about the participants based upon their reactions to the questions? I think that they all were looking for a way to um, to solve the problem without like having it escalate to violence or solve the problem in a civilized manner. I agree because I don't think anybody, any, anybody that like answered the question is like a really violent person. So I feel like that's what they would genuinely do. So the, the so you felt like their responses weren't just for the camera, but it just it really spoke to who they are as people. Yes. You each also spoke about your um, the way you are as people. What did you learn new about yourself? In what ways did you see yourselves that surprised you or that you felt like you were exposing? Um, um, were you vulnerable at all? Chris, you told a story about the fear of not coming back, you know, being oh, yeah. in a violent confrontation. Yeah. And then Solomon referred to uh, some of the uh, violent situations that we've experienced in our society. How do those uh, things relate to each other? Your personal feelings, as well as just recognizing that this is a, so a real social issue. Um, let's see. Um, I feel like, uh, I don't know. It's kind of a hard question. Think about, Think about it for a minute. I see Saul's face there. I want to. I want to ask Saul because you had an opportunity to express yourself, you know, pretty fluidly, and in yeah. some ways you added a real connection throughout the film. How did it feel for you to be able to be recorded by a sibling responding to such a such a question as human rights? Um. Well. The recording was really for me because I wanted to see like how uh, I affected the crowd in a certain way because I've been doing uh, speeches for a while. But um, doing the, the speech in general was really, um, I don't know, uh, what's the word for it? Valuable for me because um, I got to go and, you know, use my voice in order to, you know, all the people that were there were on my side, but you know, being able to use my voice to kind of try and bring about change in this country, not everybody takes up that mantle and not everybody wants to have their voice heard, you know, and um, it's a really valuable experience to be able to relate your ideas to a group of people that are like-minded individuals who are also trying to bring about change that are a part of my generation. And it was really a, um, I don't know, a beautiful experience because at the end of the day, all these people are working towards a shared goal. And, um, you know, it's really nice to see that my generation is taking an active role in uh, bringing about change in this country, so. How about you, Chris, when you think about your brother? Your brother spoke very elegantly about holding folks to consequences, giving consequences. Did you see him in a new way? Was that the way you typically see him? Did you learn something new about him? Uh, I feel like I knew he was going to, I knew like the general idea of what he's going to say, I think, because I'm around him a lot, because especially with quarantine going on, you know, just be from him a lot. Um, I feel like in his speech a little bit, I guess I got to know a little bit about it. I didn't expect, expect that exact response. So it was a little something, something new. 
Do you, do you think that his being, in some ways, and, I, and I'm going to take a risk here, he seemed to me very authoritarian, like we're going to have some rules and we're going to make sure people follow the rules. How, yeah. <laughs> how does that impact you and your way of seeing human rights? Are you also, because in some ways I felt like you came across as someone that was more questioning where someone was coming from and then investigated, whereas your brother, and I can be wrong, seemed to be more rigid, like, okay, there are rules, and if they break the rules, then they're going to be punished. No did, you, did you get that sense? Yeah. Did you see that difference? I got that sense. Because, um, yeah, it, make, it makes sense. He's kind of an authoritative person in, in real life, kind of. Um, so, yeah, the response, I, I mean, he's, he's saying, like, there's, I see what you're saying. Like, he's saying there's rules, and, like, if you break those rules, there should be a punishment, which, like, that's kind of what, like, life is. As a, it's kind of what life, yeah. But then the, not all of us uh, approach life that way. Uh, uh, Darius, you did the drawings, and in your drawings, you were a lot more fluid. You drew choices. Is that how you, when you think about human rights, is that your approach is to see what the choices are, or do you see yourself also as being someone who would pick one thing pretty regularly? I mean, how do you see yourself when you think about human rights? Um, I think more pro choices because there's different situations for different like levels of how you got violated. Like say if someone just bumped into you on the street, you wouldn't, I don't know, react as much if someone started taking off their mask and coughing on you around the scene or something like that, you know? So I think you have to assess what what like the situation is and how big of a deal it is. So although we all know that we have human rights, it sounds like you're saying for you, it's about how serious the violation is. So we spent time talking about violations. We had quite a few responses from the other young people who participated in this experience. Were you ever surprised at the types of violations? Um, Tyrone said that it was being yelled at that was a violation to him. That was something serious. Whereas uh, Tanaya said being touched was a violation to her. Um, the Tanaya, uh, Tanaya, um, the, the older young lady, Tanaya, said that what would bother, Tanaya Champ said that what would bother her is not even being touched, but the fact that someone would put their finger in her face or uh, question her opinion. Did the level of violations of the surprise you? What was a violation to your peers? Um, I feel like because uh, uh, the violation you picked, Chris, were racism. You know, picking. You know, bullying. Oh, oh, yeah, actually, yeah. Um, Those were very different violations. Yeah, I think, I feel like when you get older, your violations start to become more mature. So, like, I think, at, like, at a young age, I would have said, like, somebody, like, trying, like, somebody yelling at me or, or uh, touching my hair. I feel like I would have said that, too. But, like, as I'm starting to become more mature and getting older, I feel like, uh, uh, violations kind of changed in a bit because I don't really care like if somebody like I mean if somebody yells at me obviously like I'll like do something maybe I don't know like talk back to them or like or like if somebody touched my hair I don't really like care that much but I feel like uh when you get older uh you kind of mature and your violations get like more like of a hefty topic. Yeah, it also sounds like the, the consequences become more serious. You yeah. know, your aunt, when she spoke, she spoke about, you know, making a formal complaint. Whereas uh, our little girl, Tanaya, said several times, I'll tell my mom, I'll yeah. tell my teacher, 
I love those two side by side. And in some ways in putting this together technically, I like having those two responses side by side because they were both about telling someone. Uh, Darius, one of the things that I found interesting and funny was that you made telling the second choice and intervening the third choice. Did you notice that? Uh, I think I just sent them to you in a strange order, maybe. I, I, don't, I didn't really put them in a specific order. And I didn't change that. I just left it exactly the way you had it because I thought that was really fine. Um, so finally, in terms of the technical aspect of videography, which is, you know, putting, we, we used video production as a tool for developing this, uh, this concept of human rights. How did using videography for telling a story, how well did you feel like it worked? What would you do different? What did you learn from it? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, While you're thinking about it, I'll just share with you my experience was that I learned a lot about sound. You know how we had that problem with I can't hear? And so I took the whole video and put it in another, um, another framework, worked on it and brought it back. So I learned quite a bit about just working with sound um, and trying to clean that up. And I loved it that you came up, Chris, with using music as a way of breaking up some of the choppiness of it. But when you think about the effectiveness of the video as a storytelling, uh, as a storytelling tool, what is your response? Hmm. Um, I feel like uh, since I got brought into this program that I learned a lot about um, people and how they respond to different uh, subjects. Yeah. yeah. And actually, uh, I did too. One of the things I loved about this was uh, Darius used the word that it was a collage. And in taking what they what folks response in one minute, to have a one minute response and have folks identify a violation, talk about uh, how they felt about the violation, and talk about what they would do about the violation, and then chopping those into parts, I thought, wow, there is a lot here that connects us as human beings. We all have that sense of how do I feel, what do I want to do about it, and you know how do I get help to solve the problem. So I thought it went well with yeah. the actual drawings. How about you, Darren? Right. Can you think of anything else? Yeah, I think that um, it was really great to have a visual and uh, to see who was speaking instead of just like the audio or just like being told about it. I suppose. So having a visual was really nice. I want to thank you for your drawings because I felt like the drawings right there in the middle of that video broke it up and helped it to remain more focused on younger people as opposed to being an adult kind of, just an adult response. So I love the drawings. And then Chris, I really loved it that you told that story, you know, because I felt like at that point when you told the story about how sometimes people are crazy and they have a gun, I felt like you really escalated that whole idea of what a violate that a violation, as you just said, when you're younger, is 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 simpler. But as you get older, it becomes more uh it becomes more life threatening. And so I loved it that you were able to tell that story and still be able to even maybe whether you intended to or not talk about how you felt like what what might happen, I might not be, I might not come home, and then being able to to continue on with all of those suggestions from, you know, those other folks, even some of the older folks about, wow, you have to protest, you have to stand up for yourself. So that I thought that was really wonderful. Any other thoughts, questions that you have about human rights or video production or this this process that we've been involved in? I'd like to add something. Yeah. Um, 
I think that just having something on video is very important because you can always come back to it. It's like a picture. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. You know, what is a video worth? You know what I'm saying? Um, having video format, you'll be able to watch it forever until there's like a blackout and no internet, no nothing. But, you know, having, having something on video is like having a very well-kept book. It's something that you can always come back to always look over again, always take something new from at a certain point, you know, no matter how, how many times you watch a video, there's something that you won't, you, there's something that you haven't recognized in that video before, yes. you know, so having the video platform is very important to keeping a legacy alive, you know. I'm excited about it because this is going to be uploaded on YouTube. It's going to be on, uh, the Children of Minds, um, um, no, uh, Children's Studio School's website. I'm going to mm -hmm. post it on eBay Arts website. I'm really excited because I feel like it, it, it goes beyond just the conversation that the four of us or six of us are having right now or the 12 people who were involved, meaning your brother, your aunt, your, your neighbor, you know, um, the children. It goes beyond just that group. But the fact that it's on a video and it gets posted means that hundreds of people will be taught a new lesson based upon that experience, based upon what a group of young people got together and did, went out and interviewed other people and pulled that together. So I think that that is one of the beauties of the videography as well. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and so I want you to know that you can look for this on Children's Studio School, um, dc.org. This is where it will be located. Studio School, dc.org. And it'll also be on ebayarts.org. And I'm sure that you'll be able to find it on YouTube. Um, okay. The final thing I wanted to say was, and this made my heart so glad, the first time I met Marcia, or the first time I ever saw Marcia, was at uh, the SNCC Legacy Project. It's the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, I got involved with that project. They were doing a legacy project using videography, and it was located at the, um, Civil, the African American Civil War Museum. John Lewis was a member of that organization. He was one of the founding members and he was a part of that DC chapter. He passed away in the process of us doing this, uh, this video studio. So it was beautiful that we could have his voice and that last voice uh, being uh, read, the story, him talking about him having met Dr. King and Dr. King's uh, words to him, wow. This covers not just your generation, my generation, but even a generation beyond that. So I love it that Marcia, who was a, who was a part of that legacy project, has gone on to create a new legacy project and connect everything over time through the uh, Children's Studio School. So this was a powerful experience uh, in many ways, and I thank you all for participating in it. I'd like to show you uh, your product one more time so that you can see what you're sending out into the world. And uh, from there, we'll say our goodbyes. And I look forward to working with you and seeing you again. So may I show it to you one more time? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, here we go. The film is about protecting our human rights as people. And the question is, how do you respond when someone's words or actions violate your rights as a human being? How do you respond when someone's words or actions violate your human rights? My response is usually um, a little bit of shock. A violation that I'm unwilling to tolerate. Bullying is one. If I see anybody picking on somebody. When people yell at me. One is 
putting your finger in our, the judging of opinion. It's just like calling other people like racist slurs and stuff. First response, I would be very shocked. My first instinct would be to try to educate the other person. I would try to calm down and say, and tell them I don't like when you yell at me. I'm say, please don't touch my hair because I don't like it when you touch my hair. So when people are just saying words, that's easy for me to kind of let that roll off my back. It's up to you to choose how you want to react. Once I'm no longer shocked and I'm processing what's happening to me. And to go and speak out and speak up for the people who aren't speaking for themselves. Judging someone's opinion or my opinion, I really, I cannot, I hate it. Do you want to talk about it or something? And make sure the other party understands my point of view and understand right from wrong. I'm going to tell my mom or my teacher. Um, and we're probably dealing with something in their life, so they take it out on other people. Try to solve the problem. Okay. First choice, you could duck his head on and pretend he didn't see anything. Second choice, you could call the police. Third choice, you could try to intervene. We have to teach people how to respect us and also teach them how they want to be treated. Uh, there's no need for you to be racist. Because they may not know. And when people violate my rights with their actions and words, people can only receive help or only change their ways to the consequences. I'm um, okay with correcting someone's behavior. I would have to follow up with filing a police report, filing a complaint. To defend myself, uh, but in a way in which it does not uh, bring myself or my daughter any shame. Some people sometimes are crazy, so they have a, so they have a gun with, the, with them and they're like, I need help, and then they, and then the person refuses to bring out the gun. Oh, uh, thinking that I'm not coming back one day. Protest, confront them and say, uh, why are you doing this? Why is it to this person? Try to de-escalate the situation. Uh, because what we allow, we encourage. I am going to definitely file a complaint, a formal complaint um, against that person or that party. I'm going to tell my mom or my teacher. Take their hate and use that as positive energy. And abuse your, abuse your freedom of speech, right? Peaceful solutions and speaking out is the best way. And make sure this individual doesn't just understand my point of view, but understands the law as well. So Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd, and countless others. Philando Castile, Trayvon Martin. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. you wow, great job. Thank you so much. Round of applause. Yeah, and I saw, you know, I, I, I'm going to have to go back and work on it. I'm going to send it to uh, uh, Miss Brandy, and but I have to go back and make that spelling correction. I can tolerate a lot of the, uh, <laughs> I can tolerate a lot of the other glitches, but I can't tolerate misspell words. So I have to go back and change that one misspell word that I saw when it played this time. Did you all see anything that you want me to go back and work on? Ooh, I think it was good. Uh, it, was and very it's, it looks great. I thought it looked good too. It's just so, it has such, a, I felt like it had such a nice flow. So, and I love the ending. This is just my own preference, but I love the fact that it started off as a black and white. It had that old timey look and it ended as a black and white with that old timey look and him saying that he, you know, was listening to Martin Luther King on the old radio. I just thought that made it so tight at the end. So thinking about those technical things, how to make things work. So beautiful.
Hey. I just I wanted to give my feedback. I'm sorry for this weird background. Oh, no, go right ahead. Uh -huh. But I just wanted to say con congratulations, everybody, on a project. Well done. Yes. You all did great. I love the product. Um, I love the video. And I really enjoyed the conversation that you had today about the process. I think that, um, that this has been a, a great learning experience because we can't be together and, and necessarily learn all the technical aspects. But that's kind of the next level is um, thinking about this as a tool that you can use um, to advocate, to advocate for yourselves and for others. And um, hopefully this really does inspire you guys to think about how you can make your own um, videos and your own statement in the world, whatever that, that may be. And so I just wanna thank you eBay for asking all of those um, great questions because I think those are really um, questions we should be asking ourselves. Does it feel comfortable to answer these questions? Um, how comfortable is it to speak about um, something that is negative? Because we're not always able to do that. So good job, everybody. Good, good job. Thank I know you. Marcia is proud of everyone. That's beautiful. Thank you, Marcia, for making this possible. This was a wonderful opportunity for me to be engaged with young people. And, and as I said to Christopher and uh, Darius, it really clarified for me my love of working. I mean, not that I ever doubted it, but just this was so needed and isolation was just so wonderful to be with young people. So thank you all. All right, well, I look forward to seeing you all soon. And okay. in, in DC and we have a date for, uh, I believe it's a strawberry cake that's half strawberry cake and half carrot cake. <laughs> <laughs> can't wait. I can't wait either. You all take care of yourselves. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.